Archel Smith, 2nd Lieutenant with the 871st Troop Command. I'm your chaplain candidate. I know that uh, we're about ready to uh, come into a new year. I hope you all had a great Christmas. Um, I know a lot of you have expressed over times and, and a lot of times with New Year's resolutions, we want to we want to get back and, and become closer to God again and learn more about God. And I, I thought about that, so I wanted to begin a new series with you all. We're going to be looking into the gospel according to John. This is one of the best books of the Bible that I can think of to really help us to dig in deeper into God's word and find more about who Jesus Christ is in relation to God the Father and what Jesus came on the earth to accomplish. John is a gospel account. And I always ask this question, how many gospels are there in the Bible? And the answer may sound obvious. A lot of people say Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. There's there's four Gospels in the Bible, but that's not the right answer, and it's a, really a trick question. Um, there are there is only one Gospel in the Bible. The New Testament contains four Gospel accounts or four different views of the Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But there is only one Gospel. Each of these accounts, they focus on who Jesus Christ is. So each account, we get a little bit different view of who Jesus is in Mark and in Matthew and Luke and then John. But the word gospel means good news. And in Greek, the word is euing elion. And the reason why I can remember that word from Greek is because it always made me think of the phrase, you're an alien. And as believers, that's what we are in this world. We're aliens. We're residents here. And we, but we know that this is not our permanent home. God has a permanent place for us elsewhere. But it's also uh, the word evangel, uh, the word gospel in the New Testament is also where we get our word evangelism or evangelical. And as evangelical, you know, um, evangelicals focus a lot on evangelism, and evangelism is basically telling others the good news of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is not completely contained in the four gospel accounts found in the New Testament. So uh, you can't just say that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John make up the gospel. That's not true because there's only one gospel in the whole Bible. The gospel story spans from the beginning of the Bible in Genesis and runs all the way through the end of Revelation. And it's about the good news concerning how God has been reconciling mankind back to himself through his son jesus christ matthew mark luke and john are so similar at a glance they are called the synoptic gospels while john is similar to the other three it is a unique gospel john only contains a little bit of the information found in the synoptics gospels the word synoptics means you know same optic or same view. So if you looked, if you if you looked at Matthew, Mark, and Luke together, they look very similar, and they used each other's writings. Matthew, Mark, Luke, they were contemporaries. They used each other's writings. So for example, Matthew, the book of Matthew contains 90 to 95 percent of the book of Mark. So when Matthew wrote down his gospel account, he was using Mark as one of his primary sources. Likewise, Luke also used Mark. Mark was the first one to write. And so Luke used about half of Mark in his gospel account. And um, But John doesn't use Mark at all. And also Luke and Matthew use a source that neither uh, Mark used nor John used. So there's an independent source out there that both um, Matthew and Luke used that's not in existence today. It's interesting. Maybe someday we'll discover that source. Um, but it's interesting that those two used that source. But looking side by side, Matthew, Mark, and Luke look very similar for those reasons. 
But John, on the other hand, is a completely different gospel account, completely different narrative. So if you put John next to the synoptics, it looks completely different. It's unique. John only contains a limited amount of the information we find in the synoptic gospels. However, John, what John does is he fills in the gospel account in ways that the synoptic gospels failed to do. All four gospel accounts together are called the canonical gospel accounts, canon because they they were canonized in our scripture. They were part of our rule of faith, so to say. Um, so we do have four gospel accounts that are called the canonical gospel accounts. And it's my hope that when we end this series, so today what I'm doing is I'm just taking us through and I'm going to do some background information on John so that when we actually start so when we actually start doing our religious services on John, you'll have some of this background information out of the way. But it's my hope that by the end of this series of John's account, you will more than ever before know more about the gospel according to John um, and the man who wrote it than you ever have before. And it's a promise I'll make to you in this in this study. If you need a Bible during the, the religious services, I can bring you one. Just let me know. Um, we have Bibles on hand. Also, uh, you can download the Bible using uh, one of the Bible apps. I would um, push you to uh, read the text that we're going to be studying. Re read a little bit ahead in John. You don't have to. It's not mandatory. You can just show up to the religious service and and and, we'll, and I'll be presenting on that passage. But sometimes it might help if you read ahead. When you read the text on your own, I want you to pretend that you have never read the Bible before. Just pretend like you're reading it anew for the first time ever. And it's possible that some of you have never read John or the Bible before, so that will be easy for you. But I want you to pretend that someone simply handed you this document, the Gospel according to John, and that you're reading it for the very first time. The next thing I want to do is I want to spend some time talking about the authorship. There are several details I have to accomplish before we can just dig into the Bible and I can start preaching on John. And I wanted you guys to be familiar with these. And one of those is the authorship. The obvious question is, who wrote John? Uh, does anybody know the answer? Uh, I know um, John's in the title, but which John? And how do you know John wrote it? The problem is, is that the word John was added to the document in the second century. So um, when the document was originally written, it, it didn't have a title. The title was added by the church because the early church, early church believed it was written by John. But can we prove that it was written by John the Apostle? And the, the reason why I'm going over this is because there's a lot of Bible scholars today who disagree that John the Apostle um, wrote the Gospel according to John for centuries. Nobody argued, nobody disputed that John was the author of this Gospel account. And it was only during the rise of liberal, liberalism that um, people started questioning whether or not John really was the author of this Gospel account. And some people say it's a different John, John the Elder or John the Revelator. And some people say John didn't write this at all. Some people claim that Lazarus wrote this um, gospel account. And now with 100% certainty, we could never say who wrote the gospel according to John. It could have been John or it could have been somebody else, but we can be almost certain. And I, I hope that you'll see this after the study today is that you can be almost certain that John the Apostle wrote this. So I'm going to be taking us on a little investigation to see if we can be almost certain who wrote the gospel according to John and who this person was using like um, um, like a police skill, so to say. And there's two forms of evidence that we can talk about when we talk about the answer to about who wrote this gospel according to John. There's two types of evidence. There's internal evidence and there's external evidence. Internal evidence, which I want to start with, is the evidence that we can find inside the Bible itself. And external evidence is, is things that we can look to that support what the Bible says. Our first passage that we can look at is John chapter 1, verse 14. So the Word became human 
and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. And so what do we learn from this verse? Well, first, we learn that the author or authors were among a group of eyewitnesses. Whoever wrote this account was an eyewitness of Jesus Christ, and so they had to be alive during the first century and had walked with Jesus, seen Jesus, maybe and maybe talk with Jesus, ate with Jesus, they were eyewitnesses. If we jump down to chapter 2, verse 11, we find that it says, This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. <clears throat> John chapter 2 is a story about Jesus turning the water into wine. It's a very famous story. Uh, it's one of Jesus's, it is Jesus's first public miracle. Uh, it's not, it's probably not Jesus's first miracle, which we'll get into when I discuss this chapter, but it's his first public miracle. Um, because of this miracle, many of Jesus's disciples began to believe in him. And the first disciples later became a close group of disciples referred to as the Twelve Apostles, or sometimes just called the Twelve. Those Twelve Apostles include Peter, James, John, Matthew, Judas Iscariot, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Zealot. So, we have determined that the author is one of the Twelve Apostles, but we still don't know which one. If we turn to our Bibles to John chapter 21, verses 20 through 24, we find this portion of scripture where Peter is discussing who will be around when Jesus comes back. Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved the one who had leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked Jesus, what about this guy? What about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So the rumor spread among the community of believers that the disciple wouldn't die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This disciple is the one who testified to these events and has recorded them here. And we know that his account of these things is accurate. Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. We learn a lot from this passage. First, um, we learn that the one who wrote this by uh, this 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 gospel account was nicknamed the disciple Jesus loved, someone who was very close to Jesus, one of his twelve apostles, but someone more close than the other twelve apostles, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But we also know that the author was not Peter, because Peter is speaking to the disciple Jesus loved um, in, this, in this passage. So that narrows it down to 11 suspects. And we also learn that this disciple was reclining on Jesus at the Last Supper. So let's go to that passage, John chapter 13 to 24. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter mentioned, motioned to him and asked, Who is he talking about? So the disciple leaned over and asked Jesus, The Lord, who is it? Um, this is referring to who's going to betray Jesus, which we knew is Judas Iscariot. So Judas is not <laughs> the author of this book because Judas committed suicide um, after betraying Jesus. The passage is the first time in the gospel that the, the term the disciple Jesus loved is used. And so the disciple Jesus loved was at the, Lord's disciple, at the Lord's Supper and was reclining on Jesus um, at the Lord's Supper. And during this time period, they would, they would sit 
um, on cushions and they would kind of lean like couches like and they would lean and they would eat around the table the Lord's Supper started a section in John known as the farewell discourse where Jesus begins to tell his disciples that he's he's about to be crucified and he's telling them goodbye and he's giving them his last instructions before he departs them it lasts from chapters 13 through 17. And so if you read chapter 13 through 17, any of the disciples mentioned in this section cannot be the author um, because the disciple Jesus loved never mentions himself by name. And that rules out Peter, Philip, Thomas, Judas Iscariot, Judas, the son of James from this section. The disciple whom Jesus loved also makes an appearance at the cross in the empty tomb. John 21 through Seven, uh, 21 verse 7. The disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and headed to the shore. This is when Jesus, after Jesus' resurrection, when he appears the last time to his apostles. But one of the things I wanted us to notice from this passage is that this mystery apostle is someone who is very close to Peter. It's not Andrew. Andrew was Peter's brother, so it must be one of the core disciples. Look at verses 1 and 2 in chapter 21. It says, Later Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cain and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. The author must be among the disciples listed in this group. We have already determined that the author was not Peter or Thomas. The writer of the fourth gospel is probably not Nathaniel, since um, it wasn't characteristic for this, the author to mention himself. As we have seen, the only ones left are the sons of Zebedee. So the sons of Zebedee are James and John and two other disciples. And it's probably not James because James died way before this gospel account was written. So that leaves us with possibility of two other disciples. We're left with Matthew, Simon the Zealot, James the son of Alphaeus, Andrew and John. But out of, all, out of this group, the most unlikely it could be that wrote the gospel according to John is Matthew because Matthew wrote another gospel. So why would he need to write two gospels? That wouldn't make much sense. So that leaves us Simon the Zealot, James the son of Alphaeus, Andrew and John. And Andrew is the brother of Peter. 135 through 42. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, the Lamb of God. This is John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Look, Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you going? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard John, what John said and then followed Jesus. So there's one of the two disciples. Andrew went to find his brother Simon, which is Peter, and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Look intently, looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Kephas, which means Peter. In this passage, we see that two of John the Baptist's disciples became disciples of Jesus. Well, actually three. One of the disciples is named Andrew, and the other one is not named we also know from this passage that Andrew was uh, Peter's brother, and we can probably assume that the disciple that is not named is the author. We can also assume that Andrew is not the author for the same reason as Nathaniel. 
because it is the pattern that the author has not named himself in the Gospel according to John that narrows down the group to Simon the Zealot, who is never accredited for writing anything, James the son of Alphaeus, who was also never accredited of writing anything, and finally John. Granted, by some slim chance, we still have Nathaniel and Andrew, who were never credited with writing anything. One of the things we have already determined is that the author had a very close relationship to Peter. Now, we all have to determine um, who that person is out of the men who are left. There are many passages in the Bible that demonstrate uh, who the apostle closest to Peter was. And I, you can look up a few of those on your own if you want to. You can look up Luke chapter 22, verse 8, Luke 5, 8 through 10, Mark 5, 37, Matthew 17, 1, Mark 14, 33, Galatians 2, 9. And the answer is Peter, James, and John made up the inner core of the twelve. Um at Sunday school, some of you as children may have sung that song, Peter, James, and John in the sailboat. These were the three closest disciples to Jesus and closest to each other. So the answer is obvious that John, the apostle, was had the closest relationship to Peter and therefore was probably the disciple Jesus loved. And therefore, um, with these passages today, we have shown that in the New Testament, we can know for almost certainty, we can't know 100% certainty, that John the Apostle did write the fourth gospel account. But there is evidence outside the Bible. This is called the external evidence that John did write the fourth gospel. John's protege, his disciple that he, he really mentored and spent a lot of time with, his name was Polycarp. And he was one of the early church fathers um, John uh, promoted uh, Polycarp to the position of bishop, and um, he became one of the early church uh, leaders. Irenaeus was also trained up by Polycarp, and Polycarp attests that Polycarp, uh, Irenaeus attests that Polycarp told him that John wrote the fourth gospel count. Clement of Alexandria was another early church father. Uh, who attributed the fourth gospel to John. In fact, there are many early church fathers that attribute the gospel to John as well. The church fathers, you know, these were a group of the earliest church authorities. These were the men who took over the, the church as the apostles died. Um, Paul begins um, putting bishops in place before he died. We can read that in the book of Acts. Um, John, the apostle, was over... Uh, Asia Minor, which is Western Turkey today, and he had a group of seven churches there that he oversaw, and he put bishops in place before he died. John was the last apostle alive. Apostles had to be eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ, and um, that's why we went from apostles to bishops, because after all the apostles died, um, around the second century, we didn't have any eyewitnesses of Jesus anymore. That's when we started having bishops. And so John died sometime in the late 90s, sometime between 95 and the year 100. So John was the last apostle alive. He was the last one to write anything. And the early church fathers grew up in the church ranks while John was still alive. He was still around. And like I said, Polycarp was one of these early disciples. Therefore, with almost 100% certainty, Almost. We can't be 100%, but we can be confident that John wrote the fourth gospel. The next thing I want to talk about is, is the author. Who was John? We've already seen that John was one of the 12 apostles, and John and his brother James were the sons of Zebedee from Bethesda in Israel. So they were Jewish men. John's father owned a fishing company which employed uh, wage laborers, and therefore John was not a poor fisherman. Uh, sometimes we think of the, the apostles as poor fishermen. No, John and his brother, uh, Zebedee, the Zebedee and sons, they were probably a middle-class fishing company. 
when Jesus called James and John to be disciples in Mark 1 7, he basically told them to give up the fishing business because he was going to make them what? Fishers of people or men. Jesus gave the brothers the nicknames the Sons of Thunder in Mark 2 17. And this may have been because they had a bad temper. And we already learned that John was given the title, the disciple Jesus loved, which must indicate that their, the close, intimate relationship between John the Apostle and Jesus, they had a close friendship, a close bond. John was at the foot of the cross. He was the only disciple at the only apostle at the foot of the cross and with Jesus's mother Mary there at the cross Jesus put John who he trusted in charge of taking care of his mother Mary at the cross because um, Joseph had probably already died at this time John was also the first disciple to run into the empty tomb to see that Jesus Christ had been resurrected. He was the first apostle. Uh, there were some women who arrived earlier, and that's a shocking for this first century audience because you wouldn't normally make women the eyewitnesses to an historic event like this, uh, which indicates that the story is true. Um, but John was the first apostle to get there. He outran Peter. And then later, John spent a large amount of his life ministering in the church of Ephesus, which was the, the head church of the, the seven churches of Asia Minor in West, what is today Western Turkey. And a lot of people believe that the, maybe he, he wrote down his gospel according uh, his gospel account here, but he was also imprisoned just on an island just outside of Ephesus in Western Turkey. Um, and it's very possible that he wrote the gospel according to John there, in his revelation account uh, which is also debated about the authorship but i affirm that i i truly believe that john the apostle was the author of revelation as well and it is possible that john uh, the gospel according to john is the youngest book in the new testament which means it was the last one written down um, he could have written revelation before john so it's very possible that when we read the book of John, we, we are reading the last book of the Bible that was written down. John was writing to some early Christian, Jewish Christians. They were primarily Jews. There were some Gentiles among them. But in Asia Minor, there was a huge Jewish population. But primarily, John was writing to Jewish seekers. And so when, when he wrote this gospel account to the churches in, in Asia Minor, he did it with the intent that they would go out and use the gospel account to show others who Jesus Christ is. John wrote uh, this gospel account sometime after the destruction of the temple in Israel in 70 AD, and one of jo John's themes is that Jesus becomes our temple now. Jesus is the temple. John wrote his gospel in about 90-ish, 95, and it was already in circulation in the early church in the beginning of the second century. Take a look at this fragment right here that I have displayed on the screen. This is John Ryland's P52 fragment. This is our oldest um, existing fragment of the gospel according to John. Now what's interesting is, is this dates back to around the year 125 AD which means it was only written 20 years, I mean copied down 20 years after John wrote the very first gospel account on, on that papyrus. He wrote it down and it was copied and within 20 years that gospel account had spread all the way to Egypt and this papyrus, John Ryland's papyrus was discovered in Egypt only 20 years after John wrote down the Gospel according to John. That's pretty amazing considering there was no email, no mail carrier system like the post office today. Uh, this was copied by hand and had to go from place to place. 
And just within 20 years, we already have a copy of the Gospel according to John in Egypt. Really far away from Turkey. Think about how far Egypt is away from Turkey. The Gospel according to John is a gospel genre, which means good news. And like other gospel accounts, John describes the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So like Matthew, Mark and, uh, like Matthew and Mark, John is what's called an ancient bios, or biography. Uh, Luke is an, a historical monograph, so it's, it's more of a history. It's not considered bios, like uh, Matthew, Mark, and John. Ancient biographies, they differed a lot of ways from modern biographies. <clears throat> For example, a modern biography will look at a whole a person's entire life from the time they were born until the time they died. They would look at major accomplishments along the way, along the way, significant details along the way. Ancient biographies did not do this. They focused on the adult life because they believed that the most important thing that they were trying to portray in the biography was the person's character, not necessarily what the person did or what he accomplished, but what was the person's character. That was the most important thing in an ancient biography. And so, um, and the ancients, they believed that you were born with your character and your character didn't develop over time. And so there's not a lot of influence, uh, much um, written about the person's childhood. So if you look at the all four Gospels accounts, we get a little bit written about Jesus' childhood in Luke and a little bit about his birth in Matthew and nothing about his childhood in the other Gospel accounts. And we jump, basically we're jumping right into the ministry of Jesus from John the Baptist until the crucifixion. And that's why, because they're trying to get the audience to understand who Jesus is, about his character. The second thing we have to realize about ancient biographies is that they're not written in chronological order. So they're not written from birth to death. Um, ancient biographies are written in, um, for example, um, John is written in theological order. So something that happened towards the end of Jesus's ministry in John may be placed in the beginning of the book of John. So it's not like this happened and this happened and this happened chronologically. John's placing these things in certain order for theological purposes, for theological uh, points that he's trying to make about Jesus. So chronology was not important to the ancients. And a third thing we have to really understand about the ancient uh, cultures was that they were an oral culture. Only about 10% of the people were uh, literate. 90% of the people could not read or write at all. Um, they uh, Some of them barely could read signs on buildings. So they were an oral culture. They did everything by oral transmission, from person to person, by memory. Uh, and so um, in this culture, it was okay to do th things like paraphrase somebody. So sometimes we see a, a Jesus say something a certain way in Matthew, and it might be a little bit different in Luke or a little bit different in in, in uh, Mark, because they're paraphrasing them. They're not quoting Jesus word for word. We don't. They didn't care about literal quotation marks or anything like that. Uh, the important was what was Jesus trying to say, and what does it reveal about who Jesus is. And so John, one of the things that John does more than all the other gospel accounts is he has all these asides. He'll quote Jesus and he says, "This means blah blah blah." So there's a lot of asides there. Now, in all of the gospel accounts, there's a lot of focus on Jesus' death because people in the ancient cultures believed that the way a person died reveals the most about their character, which is odd because Jesus was crucified, which is the most um, shameful way to die in the Jewish culture. There is no more shameful way to die, and, and this was a shame-based culture. And so they spend a lot of time talking about Jesus' death and resurrection and what it really meant and how Jesus was taking on our shame. And so that's why there's so much focus, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all like the entire second half of their gospel accounts are focused on the passion narrative, whereas they only spend half of the book talking about Jesus's ministry. 
And that's why, because they're trying to convey why this was so significant. Why would the Son of God die in such a shameful fashion? That would be such a shock for the original audience. Another thing is, uh, you know, uh, ancient biographies contain a lot of mundane or insignificant details about Jesus' life. The reason why is because, you know, modern biographies, they try to keep us interested. They try to keep us engaged because um, they look for those stories that are uh, really uh, great. But ancient biographies are trying to reveal the character of Jesus. And so there's a lot of mundane things that we just consider insignificant. But they were significant to the ancient audience because it revealed who Jesus was. And unlike the other Gospels, John was very selective in what he wrote in his Gospel count. Uh, he doesn't include the birth stories. He doesn't include the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he doesn't really include much information about Jesus' baptism, uh, the transfiguration, Jesus' temptation by Satan, the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, however, John supplements these stories with teachings Jesus not found in other synoptics. So John's writing about 30 years after the other synoptic gospels were written down. And so when John wrote his gospel, there were already three others in existence, not to mention the entire New Testament was in existence. And so John was the last one to write in the Bible. John wrote to Jewish seekers to prove that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God who came in flesh from God the Father. And so John can be broken down into two basic halves, the book of signs and the book of glory. The first half or book of signs focuses on the miracles of Jesus, uh, which we which are called signs in the gospel according to John. So there are seven signs that John is using to uh, prove or point to that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world so that you might believe in him for your salvation. And the second half of John is called the book of glory, and it focuses on uh, the purpose of why Jesus came, his passion, his glory in the community of believers, um, his death, his resurrection, the ministry that takes place afterwards, and the work of the Holy Spirit that accomplishes that. One of the things to keep in mind is that John did not write in chronological order, as I've said. So the book, so that's how we can have two distinct tabs, the book of signs and the book of glory. He's writing for theological purposes. It's a very different type of style of writing from uh, the way the modern people write. So the themes of John include that God the Father sends Jesus Christ, his only Son. And John describes um, the Father God and Jesus Christ as one. And that's a major theme in this book, how Jesus Christ was sent from the Father, but they are one. And Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. And that Jesus is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. He is our Savior. Salvation is only through Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is the one who helps carry out the mission of Jesus. In the Gospel according to John, we're going to see that Jesus had the Holy Spirit without limit, it says. And then after Jesus uh, comes, he says, another is coming after me, who is the Paracletos, our helper, our counselor. The Holy Spirit is the one who's going to accomplish the work that Jesus came to. Jesus started the work. Jesus defeated death and sin on the cross. And the Holy Spirit begins that restoration back to the Father. So we covered a lot of ground today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. But um, I wanted to get this background information out to you so that when we begin doing our religious services through the gospel, uh, according to John, you'll have that already in your mind and I won't have to go through that information so much in our in our religious services. Well, have a great new year everybody. I'll see you soon in January. God bless.